One, two, three, four. News, culture, astronomy, physics, humanities, space, science, travel, boom, knowledge, boom, knowledge, history, humor, technology, game, business. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, that murky period between like midnight and 5 a.m. You know, whichever it is, whenever it is, wherever you are on the planet, the third one from the sun, one with all the crazy stuff crawling all over it. And actually, by one estimate, extrapolating from all the data we have, which isn't nearly enough, well, it has bacterial, fungal, animal, and all the rest at some possible one trillion species, which is insane. And if 0.000001% of those told a friend about this podcast, I would so be in business. Well, anyway, welcome to Boom Knowledge. It's a podcast dedicated to cool trivia, facts, figures, data, and the exploration of every last interesting thing we humans know as a species, served up 20 to 30 minutes at a time, eh, give or take. And I'm your host, Mike Vass, and I appreciate you pod tuning in on your pod device and pod land. Pod, thank you. Welcome to the pod, pod people. And I'm coming off an extended and much needed break. My dad had surgery and I had about 12 billion things going on outside of that. And in addition to all of it, I hit what we humans refer to as the wall. Good old fashioned burnout, followed by stress and mild discomfort. And well, you're human, you know the drill. And that was followed by extreme tactical reprioritization, which included a product launch, some much needed and overdue downtime full of comics and actually going out on a Saturday night, Mario's game from episode 30, Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, (laughs) definitely made the scene, and all kinds of other fun lifey life stuff. You know, speaking of the Star Wars Mobile Click Fest, it's not the kind of game that would typically hold my attention for long, but I'll be damned if I'm not leveling my Boba Fett and farming the heck out of my Jedi squad. And well, anyway, nice work, Mario, you beautiful time burgling bastard. I also took a little time to write some music, which is something you'll hear featured in today's episode and really all segment shows going forward, unless I get an overwhelming amount of feedback that it was in fact a failed experiment. So I would appreciate your thoughts if you have them. Don't hesitate to reach out and let me know what you think. Okay, on with the show, episode 31, the one that got it all back on track. Segment one shall be... Well, actually, the only segment, because it is a big one. We're going to do a deep knowledge on cell phones. Sure, you waste a boatload of time playing Galaxy of Heroes on them, but they're actually phones too, with a rich, interesting, and I'm sure as you'll see, frankly surprising history. I'll also talk about the birth of mobility, what the term cellular actually means, and how the little buggers allow us to talk to each other with our voices and our faces and all the rest of it. And since I've been on hiatus a while, the latter portion of the show will be a catch-up frag list of sorts. That, of course, is the random array of cool stuff I learn about thanks to my own devious browsing and contributions from generous listeners. It's a tech-heavy boom show today, my friendly friends, so let's get this introduction patented already and move from design to full production. Manufacturing will build this episode in total, the pricing team will figure out what it's worth, operations will set up all the payment, supply chain, and fulfillment details. Ah, crud. I guess we're going to have to recruit a marketing team to bring traffic and awareness. Maybe a salesperson or two would be needed inside and out to sell it so it gets sold. We promise 10 features that cannot be delivered. We're horribly over budget. Shannon from marketing is pregnant with triplets and heading out on maternity tomorrow. Damn, that was fast. Oh well, ship it anyway. I talk a lot about my father on this podcast which will probably come as a mild surprise to him if he ever actually buckles down and listens to the thing. He's been threatening to do so for weeks now. 
I think part of the barrier there is that he's not deeply tech savvy. And I don't mean that as a jab. My pops has many fine qualities and abilities and attributes and in general is smart as a whip. But we've always had that relationship where I'm family tech support, which goes back to the days of hooking up the stereo and programming the VCR. And I'm sure there are listeners that can totally relate to this experience. I'm certain he doesn't really know how to get started with a podcast because there's a barrier there. I'm just going to have to download it for him at some point. Now, I mention all this in the spirit of deepest irony because the old man has been neck deep in technology the bulk of his adult life. Now, by way of example, he rolled up in his Jaguar to the very garage that Steve Jobs and Wozniak were inventing in, wading through the pot smoke and Birkenstocks to sell those guys parts that went into the first Apple computers, right? Some serious tech foundation. That's like a pedigree and a half. And to bring this to topic, because he was a distributor sales king in the early days of Silicon Valley, there were some things that were staples of my childhood that many other kids probably had zero access to. The first was the car phone. A phone. In the car. Like, permanently attached. Little antennas sprouting out of the hood for maximum James Bond-esque communication. But even better, and by today's standards, far more amazing, the briefcase phone. It was a whole briefcase dedicated to a phone. Put your precious papers and so forth in another briefcase, Buster, because this one is spoken for. Not only did dad have both of these, he used them frequently, especially the car phone. And you can imagine how cool it was for my young self whenever dad would say, hey, can you call your mother and let her know we are on our way home or heading to the store or, you know, whatever, son? He doesn't really talk like that. But anyone with a car phone in the 80s totally should talk like that because you were a ridiculous badass and you deserve it. Now, dad was definitely on a bleeding edge for certain, but like every other thing I talk about on the show, the history of wireless and mobile communication goes back so much further than I would have guessed. In this case, multiple decades. And actually, because I am certain I will get an email or a message saying this if I don't just say it outright myself, Wireless communication existed long before electromagnetism, integrated circuits, the discovery of radio waves, or really anything else post-industrial age. Message runners, the Pony Express, smoke signals, carrier pigeons, good old-fashioned post, and so on were all perfectly acceptable means of wireless communication in an era before anyone knew what a wire even was. But they were slow. So slow. Dear God, were they slow. You know, right, wrong, or indifferent, I make people unhappy if I don't respond to Messenger within an hour. We're living in a different space. And that brave new era all started with one invention, the telegraph, which if you aren't familiar, was a simple system utilizing Morse code to dash and dot everything from banking data to Dear John letters. The wired version, invented by Mr. Morse himself, was developed in the 1830s and 40s and utilized throughout the 19th and even the early part of the 20th century. But early wireless transmitters for telegraph appeared in the late 19th and very early 20th centuries, thanks to a gentleman named Guglielmo Marconi. He, of course, was a Japanese man who, (laughs) just kidding, have you ever heard a more Italian name than Guglielmo Marconi? Well, anyway, Mr. Marconi was an electrical engineer with a true gift for invention. His work would land him a Nobel Prize in physics in 1909 and earn him a place in history as one of the inventors of radio full stop. The king of Italy even made him a marquee. He was able to demonstrate his successes in wireless telegraphy as early as 1896 at the incredible age of just 21. Think about that. What were you doing when you were 21? I know for me, it wasn't anything as cool as inventing wireless. Now, these initial forays would be improved upon and commercialized by the Marconi Wireless Corporation, which enabled, among other things, communication between seafaring vessels and coastal stations. This was great for weather reporting and important relay overall. Ah, but I already have a surprise in the early history of mobile communication. While commercialization of wireless begins with telegraphy, 
the first mobile phone chat goes all the way to the beginning of phones overall. Alexander Graham Bell and Charles Sumner Tainer invented a device in 1880 called the Photophone, which is an awesome name for a band, by the way. And because Boom Knowledge is a full-service podcast, I even did some hunting and can find no mention anywhere of a band named Photophone. So you're welcome. Right. So Bell and Tainter were so far ahead of the game, it's well, it's almost comical. These guys had a wireless conversation using modulated light beams. By the way, everything about that sentence is awesome. Yeah, they did that in 1880. Now, unfortunately, and really no big deal since they couldn't lose invention-wise anyway, but the photophone wasn't practical as designed and therefore was lost to the annals of history. It just couldn't be commercialized. But I'm rocking a 2017 mention anyway. Kudos to Bell and Tainter for having a mobile conversation in friggin' 1880 because that's just absurdly rad. So the next logical question to ask, knowing that the first mobile conversation happened between a couple of friggin' time travelers, and that mobile telegraphy came to the world thanks to the Italian Marquis de Radio Marconi in the very early 1890s, when did mobile telephony make the scene? Again, the 80s aren't even close. The Germans implemented some mobile communication on trains in the first part of the 20th century. And then in the 1940s, handheld radio transceivers came into use. But get this, the first mobile phones for automobiles, they showed up in 1946. That's four decades before the marvel that was my dad's first car phone. These devices were monsters, weighing in at 80 pounds and featuring a grand total of just three channels. Now, over time, this expanded some, but capacity limits were still hit quickly by those early adopters lucky enough to ride the first wave. Okay, from this point in the 40s, things escalate very quickly. AT&T introduced the Mobile Telephone Service, or MTS, in 1949. It went out to 100 towns with 5,000 customers placing 30,000 calls per week, which is actually kind of a shocker. 30,000 calls using mobile telephony at the end of the 40s. Now, these devices were huge. They used push-to-talk systems, much like walkie-talkies or trucker and police radios do today. And that call had to be connected manually by an operator. But then that wasn't such an odd phenomena in early telephonic communication in general. I mean, the era of the operator was still somewhat in effect even when I was a kid. Things weren't cheap for the customer either. The service in 1949 was $15 per month with 30 to 40 cents per call. That's the equivalent of $200 for service plus up to $5 per call today. And well, that service isn't so off a lot of modern cell phone plans, but add in that per call cost and holy wow, ow, that is really expensive. In 1965, AT&T introduced the Improved Mobile Telephone Service, or IMTS for short. And as has been established in other episodes of Boom Knowledge, early branding wasn't all that sophisticated and took more of a name it what it is approach. That letter I represented the ability for users to make calls without the assistance of an operator, and it shrunk the size and weight of the equipment down as well. Also in the 60s, Radio Common Carrier, or RCC, hit the streets in direct competition with IMTS. None of these services allowed for any roaming to different networks, which was absolutely a problem that needed to be solved. You couldn't use, say, your San Francisco-based phone to chat in Omaha, Nebraska. So add on to that plenty of issues with cost, size, call quality, scalability, usability, and pretty much everything else modern technology companies work to streamline in the extreme. But the seeds had been sown. Which brings us back up to the 80s. Everything changed with the commercialization of a technology whose name you know in the core of your soul, even if you may not understand precisely what it refers to. Cellular. Okay, what exactly is cellular anyway? Imagine if you will a grid, and if it helps, just picture graph paper in your head. (laughs) Now, lay that graph paper in your mind over a map of, say, Washington State or California, or Vietnam, you know, whatever region is easiest for you. 
And actually, if you want to get a little fancier and possibly more accurate, instead of graph paper with squares, you can picture a hexagonal grid. Hardcore tabletop gamers will have no problem doing this from all those years of Battletech, Neuroshima Hex, Twilight Struggle, and so on. Now, whether you're picturing squares or hexes, well, that doesn't particularly matter. Whichever you chose, now imagine each of these has a little radio tower icon in its center. Voila. You have just imagined a cellular network, with each square or hexagon representing one cell in the overall array. Now, in the real world, the precise pattern and layout of each cell and subsequent tower isn't as uniform as a square or hexagonal graph, but the core concept remains the same. Each individual cell provides a set of frequencies that interface with a radio base station and, of course, your cell phone. Different cells can use the same frequencies as long as they are distributed in a way as not to conflict. Neighboring cells just can't share the same frequency group. Now, this might sound a little bit confusing as described, but it's really easy to grasp if you see it laid out on graph paper. So just trust me when I say it's both clever and simple, and if you're really curious, you can easily see an example by looking up cellular on Wikipedia. Now, an interesting and fun fact about cellular is, while it was commercialized in 1979 in Japan, and then later in 83 in the US by AT&T, the concept, surprise, surprise, goes back quite a ways. It was conceptualized by Bell Labs engineers Douglas H. Ring and W. Ray Young as early as 1947. While the concept was obviously incredibly sound, well, the technology just didn't exist to light it up. The core idea was there though, and it would be developed through the 60s and the 70s to account for such concepts as interference reduction and a huge one, continuity, that is, calls traveling across cells. I mean, a handheld device would be great and all in just your home or office, but the real glory comes in from being able to start a call in your car in one town and finish it two towns over. And obviously there are some potentially significant safety and social drawbacks that we're, well, still trying our best as humans to work through here in 2017. So that core concept of cellular exists to this day, but it's been through some iterations and generations. In fact, the G in 3G and 4G stands for exactly that, generation. Generation one, which wasn't called generation one at the time, that nomenclature actually arose after 3G. Well, anyway, 1G was analog. It was commercially introduced in the United States in 1983, and it is the exact technology my dad purchased, or I should say his company purchased for him. It was from Cellular One in the Bay Area in 1984, and it cost $1,700 for the equipment and a small fortune for the phone calls. Again, money on an expense account, so not a big deal for my salesman dad. 1G worked better than anything before it, but it was still prone to problems both in terms of the devices themselves with their short battery life and long charge times and the network, which had all kinds of security and bandwidth and just other plagues upon it. Which brings us to digital and the 90s. This is really the birth of the modern cell phone. Advances overall made them ubiquitous, laying the groundwork for the modern era. And 2G also saw the birth of a very world-changing technology. SMS text messaging, with the first ever text message being sent in the UK in 1992. And actually, as an aside, the UK and Europe in general were really ahead of the United States in terms of phone usage. My first trip to the UK was in 1994, and everyone seemed to have not just one phone, but often two. Prepaid phones were the thing, and they were king. Traveling by train? particularly through tunnels, you were reminded the second service returned because all passengers not only had one phone, but also quite frequently two, with the volumes up to max. The phones would let you know the second service returned thanks to a cacophony of dings. And that brings us to the 2000s, which brought 3G and mobile broadband, which about catches us up. Mobile streaming, internet browsing, and all the rest of it escalated insanely quickly from this point. 
And that's just a quick overview of the Gs, because really it's been 1G, 2G, 3G, 3.5G, 4G, 4.5G, with all the sub-technologies and permutations contained therein. Enough for a whole series of podcasts about the esoteric details of mobile history. No matter how deep you look, there is no question that we have evolved quickly and impressively. Now, there's one component of phone history that I've left out to this point, and it is a whopper. As we all know, phones aren't just phones anymore, and really haven't been for a very long while. The majority of us now carry incredibly powerful mobile computers. At a certain point, well, the stupid phone went and got itself smart. That point commercially, unbelievably, was 1994 with IBM Simon, a handheld device with a touchscreen and personal digital assistant technology, or PDA for short. That's right, touchscreen, address book, calendar, calculator, notepad, on-screen keyboard with the ability to receive email and fax 23 years ago. The Simon cost $899 with a contract or $1,099 without. That's the equivalent of either $1,500 or $1,800 today. Now, there is no doubt whatsoever that the Apple changed the world with the release of the iPhone in 2007. But just stop to think for a second that a touchscreen handheld phone was prototyped 15 years earlier. Mind blower, right? Okay, I do have a bigger mind blower than that. If you're in any way a science enthusiast, you've probably heard of Nikola Tesla. His invention highlight reel includes alternating current, which provides power generation to all of North America. Suck that, Edison. Who, I'm just going to say it, was a jerk, by the way. That's a topic I'll cover in another podcast. Tesla also created fluorescent bulbs 40 years before they were commercialized. X-rays, remote control, the electric motor. Oh, and plot twist, radio. Now, Mr. Marconi, who I mentioned earlier, the Marquis Marconi, was brilliant and clearly played a significant role in radio communication. But in 1943, the Supreme Court overturned Marconi's patent, finding that, in fact, Nikola Tesla had invented radio two years earlier. Surprise! Okay, so to the mind blower, or it might not be such a mind blower when you understand the scope of Tesla's brilliance. I'm just going to quote the man here. When wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be converted into a huge brain, which in fact it is, all things being particles of a real and rhythmic whole. We shall be able to communicate instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face, despite the intervening distances of thousands of miles and the instruments through which we will be able to do this will fit in a vest pocket. Yeah, the man said that in 1926. Love that guy. As for the future of smartphones, well, if history is an indicator, the sky is really the limit. Consider for a moment that the device in your pocket has more processing power than the equivalent 20th century supercomputer. Future features could include hologrammatic or three-dimensional screens, fully augmented reality, and well, who knows what else. Maybe a VR interface for beyond top-of-the-line mobile gaming. As a lifelong techno enthusiast, I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes next. From car to briefcase to beeper, yep, I totally had one of those, to my first Motorola monster cell phone, to my current iPhone 7. Well, I bought the ticket ages ago when you could still do so from the box office, handed a piece of paper. I'm definitely along for the ride. And presumably, phones will still be able to make telephone calls as well, so that you can use your voice to chat with the human the old fashioned way, like your grandparents and your great grandparents in the dark days before SMS, Messenger, WhatsApp, Snapchat, WeChat, Tango. There you have it, my friends. After a full month away, we are back in business. And thanks for listening to another episode of Boom Knowledge. And yeah, I know, I said I was going to do an extended frag list, but I guess I didn't time this episode so well because well, the extended frag list would have added another 15 minutes and I'm already at my perfect special time, if you will. 
And I'll just save that one for next time because, well, I feel like I'm on a roll and it's better to just get these things out. If you liked what you heard, please tell your friends. Perfectly happy with all aspects of my little podcast here, but I would love some additional bodies to join in the fun. So you bring the body, I'll bring the fun. <laughs> Worst slogan ever. Have a great week, y'all. Send lots of SMS messages to your friends and call your mother. I'll see you next week in the future. Ooh, knowledge.